Parkinson's disease, also called PD, is a neurodegenerative disorder characterized by the progressive loss of dopamine-producing neurons in the brain. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that plays a crucial role in coordinating movement among other functions. As dopamine levels decline, individuals with PD experience motor symptoms, such as tremors, rigidity, slowness of movement, and postural instability. Additionally, non-motor symptoms like depression, cognitive impairment, and autonomic dysfunction can also manifest. The current medications used to combat PD primarily aim to alleviate symptoms by either increasing dopamine levels or mimicking its effects. These medications fall in several categories, the first being levodopa. Levodopa is the most effective medication for managing motor symptoms of PD. It is a precursor to dopamine and crosses the blood-brain barrier, where it is converted to dopamine. The second, dopamine agonists. These medications directly stimulate dopamine receptors in the brain, mimicking the effects of dopamine. They are often used together or as an alternative to levodopa, particularly in younger patients, to delay levodopa-related motor complications. The third class is monoamine oxidase inhibitors, or MAO-B inhibitors for short. MAO-B inhibitors inhibit the enzyme monoamine oxidase B, which breaks down dopamine in the brain. By blocking this enzyme, these medications increase the dopamine levels and prolong its effects. The fourth type are catechol O methyltransferase inhibitors, or COMT inhibitors for short. These inhibitors block the enzyme catechol O methyltransferase, which metabolizes levodopa in the peripheral tissues. By inhibiting this enzyme, COMT inhibitors prolong the half life of levodopa in the bloodstream, enhancing its effectiveness and reducing motor fluctuations. And the last class are anticholinergic medications. These drugs help alleviate tremors and rigidity by blocking the action of acetylcholine, another neurotransmitter in the brain. However, they are less commonly used due to their side effects, including cognitive impairment and worsened memory. While these medications can effectively manage the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, they do not halt or reverse the underlying process. A new molecule belonging to the third class, the MAO-B inhibitors, has been developed, and it has been found to be very effective in combating Parkinson's, as well as improving the condition of other neurological disorders, such as Alzheimer's and spinal cord injury. This new inhibitor is the molecule KDS-2010, a modified amino acid. It is patented and produced by the company Neurobiogen in South Korea. The drug is now undergoing long-term clinical trials to further evaluate it, but it seems to already have good results. It being a modified amino acid and a relatively simple one makes it quite interesting, as it is relatively easily produced, and it is always fun to see smaller, simpler molecules being effective, since we see a lot of extremely large molecules in medicine, and they keep getting bigger. So let's just see how it is made, directly stolen from the inventors with a little tweaking. So to get started, I set up a large flask in a heating mantle and mix 750 ml of toluene with 140 ml of water. I then degas this mixture by bubbling nitrogen through it, which will expel dissolved oxygen, which can interfere with the reaction and decrease the yield. When that's done, I add in 19 grams of the first reagent 4-bromobenzaldehyde, which was very affordable. Then the next reagent is the whole bottle, which is 25 grams of 4 prime trifluoromethyl phenylboronic acid, which was also decently priced. As the base, I use 53 grams of sodium carbonate. And as the catalyst, 2.5 grams of tetrakis triphenylphosphine palladium zero, which is probably the most expensive reagent in the whole synthesis. The reaction immediately turns green, and I quickly attach a condenser with a nitrogen balloon on top, to keep it under an inert atmosphere. I heat this mixture to a boil and let it reflux for 18 hours. This reaction is a typical Suzuki reaction, where we couple a boronic acid with an organohalide in the presence of a palladium catalyst at a base to give the carbon-carbon coupled product. It works through a catalytic cycle that is better left to Google to explain. When I return, the mixture has become a dark red and I replace the condenser with a short path distillation apparatus. First, I distill off part of the solvent under atmospheric pressure because it's quite full. And when the flask has become less full, I use a vacuum to distill it all over. When that's done, a solid black mass is left behind with a very aromatic and artificial smell, which reminds me of biphenyl that I made before. So that's a good sign. To purify it, I first redissolve it all into some methyl acetate and then add a bunch of sea light, which will lightly hold onto all of the components. I then attach the short path again and again distill off all of the solvent, leaving me with an intimate mixture of sea light and the reaction products. This I can use to do column chromatography, which is a method to separate compounds, 
and the sea light will help compress the components more tightly into bands and improve separation. Before setting up the column, I run a TLC of this product, compared to the starting materials, to check the polarity of the components in my product mixture. The boronic acid starting material doesn't seem to stain, but it's not really a problem, since it's likely to have all reacted away anyway. We can see that with the 4-bromobenzaldehyde, as it doesn't show up in the product mixture. Now we have three unknown spots. One is the product, and the other two are impurities. I expect the product to have similar polarity to 4-bromobenzaldehyde, so I assume that the spot closest to it is the product, which is also the biggest spot, and might be an indicator that it is the major product, though it depends on how well each compound stains. Since my reaction scale is a bit large for columning, I will use less silica than normally required for this amount. Otherwise, I would need more than 400 grams of silica gel to separate the components properly. But in this case, the perfect separation is luckily not needed, since the impurity that is this spot can be removed in the second column a lot easier. So with this column, I just remove whatever is on top and at the baseline. So I set up a column and weighed out about 150 grams of silica gel. I mix that thoroughly with the alguent, which is 20% ethyl acetate in hexanes. I then pour it all into the column along with more aluminum that I run through several times to pack the silica tightly. When that's done, I put a small layer of sand on top to protect the silica. Now here I have all the sea light product mixture, and I put it all on top of the column. I then first run small amounts of solvent through, so that it doesn't diffuse upward, and afterwards run the column normally by passing the same aluminum through it and collecting the liquid in fractions. When that's done, I have collected about 48 fractions, plus one bigger fraction at the start. Checking some of these fractions on TLC, it looks like the middle spot is actually two spots close together, and it starts to be visible around fraction 10. So I will just take fractions 10 to 48, combine them, and evaporate them down. After that, a white solid is left behind, and I break it up with a spatula, and move it to a dish. The yield turned out to be 20.3 grams, which is 77%. This is more than a 58% from literature, but probably just because of the impurity that is in here, and maybe some remaining solvent, though it's hard to tell if these impurities are actually significant or not. Anyhow, moving on with the next and final reaction. I set up the flask that contains the product residue in a heating mantle, and add in 80 ml of glacial acetic acid. I add in 10 grams of the previous product, as the first reactant, and then 5.93 grams of L-alaninamide hydrochloride as the second reactant. Now for this reaction, I will try a new reagent called hydrosilitrate that I made in my last video. And I want to see if it works well as a replacement for sodium cyanoborohydride, which is normally used for this reductive amination, as well as many others. I then leave it to stir for three hours at 25C. In this reaction, the amine and the aldehyde react to form the corresponding secondary amine. After reduction by hydrosilatrane, how it works is we have a nucleophile, the amine of alaninamide, which attacks the electrophilic aldehyde, resulting in this intermediate that undergoes a proton transfer to form this amine and hydroxyl. The hydroxyl is protonated by the acetic acid and is then kicked off as water, and the free electron pair from the amine moves to form a double bond to make up for it, giving this aminium. Hydrosilatrane is able to reduce the aminium, so the hydride of hydrosilatrane attacks the aminium carbon, and the double bond electrons move onto the nitrogen, giving the final amine and probably this acetosilatrane. Some substituted silatranes are potent neurotoxins. It is said that the reaction with hydrosilatrane is safe, so it is likely more the case for non-polar substituents. Still, some awareness is advisable. When I come back, it seems some stuff has precipitated. I dilute this mixture with 250 ml of the solvent dichloromethane. I then weigh out a small excess of sodium hydroxide, compared to the acetic acid I added before, and dissolve it in some water. I add this solution gradually to the mixture to destroy all the acid. It first turns yellow, and then becomes cloudy again. I keep adding more sodium hydroxide solution until there is no more exotherm upon addition, signaling that all the acid is gone. I then separate the layers and extract the water layer several times with ethyl acetate, instead of dichloromethane, since that seemed to have better solubility. The combined dichloromethane and ethyl acetate extracts are a cloudy mixture. To remove remaining droplets of water, I add some anhydrous sodium sulfate, 
which will absorb them. The transparency doesn't really change. And I then filter it all through some cotton, directly into a flask to remove the sodium sulfate. I set this up for vacuum distillation to remove all the solvent, giving an off-white solid. Now I have to do the exact same as before, since I will have to do column chromatography again. So I have mixed it with sea light and ran a TLC on it. I compare it with the starting biphenyl and we see that it disappeared in the product, but the small impurity is still there. The new amine product is below it and at the baseline we have the second starting material, alaninamide. The two components are still pretty close together, but now that the impurity is above the product and it should be a small percentage, it can easily be run off the column first. And so we should be able to get the product pure. So, I have already set up a column and taken the product into sea light. I put it all on top and do the exact same as the first column. In the end, I collected about 30 small fractions and one big fraction at the start. Analyzing it with TLC, we see that the big fraction 0 contains only impurity and fraction 1 still contains some of it as well. I discard both of those and take fraction 2 and all that came after. I combine all of those in a large flask and distill off all of the solvent. Then, a small amount of slightly off-white solid is left behind. That should be the final amine product. The yield turned out to be 0.73 grams, which is a very sad 5.7% compared to the 53% from literature. This is definitely the botched work of hydrosilatrain. So now we also know you can't just simply substitute any reaction with it using a standard protocol. Expected, but unfortunate. Though at least it did do something to give a little bit of product. The smell of this product also has the characteristic biphenyl scent, but it is noticeably different from the first product and smells a bit better, yet still very artificial. In the future, I will do some HNMR analysis to see if it is really the product. But for now, I will do a rough melting point test to get some more insight. The melting point is supposed to be 144 to 147C. So I fill a small dish with some solvent that has a higher boiling point, which is dimethyl sulfoxide. I then put the temperature probe into the liquid and start heating it. When the probe reaches 140C, it starts to melt. And when I take it out, it quickly becomes a solid again. The probe isn't perfect and it is very unlikely to be a coincidence. So it is fair to assume we have the product here. I also melted down the rest of the product and then I forgot the cap was loose and dropped it. Oopsie. Bye.